Donna Maxey, founder director of Race Talks, and I was instructed that from now, that I need to announce to you that we have a newcomer's uh, orientation, and would y'all please be quiet? Because there were people who were talking last time while this went on, and then folks upset. So please listen. You may whisper, but uh, listen to the introduction, please. Thank you. And I'll be back when that's over. Kind of an introduction about what Race Talks is about. We're doing this for newcomers. We're excited that you're here. Race Talks was started out of um, when I was asked to speak at a McMenamin's History Pub, and the topic was urban renewal, urban removal. Anyway, in your brochure here, we have several things you might want to take your brochure and look at it. Be flexible and fluid about the schedule, it does change. There's also the Jefferson High School. Um, we have race talks the first week of the month at Jefferson High School. And if you're interested in being a part of a dialogue group, you can fill this out and leave this form. There should be a brown envelope on your table. Tear this off and leave it in the envelope and we will get in touch with you about dialogue groups. We're working on those right now. If you turn to the other side of the brochure, there is, um, we have rules. We have the race talks ground rules. And um, we really try to encourage people to follow these rules. And they're important that people feel safe being here. I've had people of color who have said, this is the first time I've ever told a white person how I really feel. And I've had white people who have said, this is the first time that I was able to talk about race and not worry about putting my foot in my mouth. I feel safe to talk, I feel safe that I will be accepted and I won't be beat up for, for saying or asking what seems like an obvious and stupid question. So that's really important. So what we encourage people to do is to listen to each other with curiosity, respect differences, agree to disagree. You don't have to agree with everything somebody says. You can agree that that's their opinion. I don't agree with Rush Limbaugh, but he has a right to speak his opinion. Speak from the self and, not, and, and from the heart. It means when you're speaking, don't talk about, I know somebody who, either it's you and you were involved with the person or, you know, speak from your own experience, not someone else's. Respect confidentiality. Now, because you're involved in these discussions, you have a right to go out and share the discussion that happened at your table. But what we're asking you to do is if you do share something that someone else has said, to not give their name, to not give their location. Contribute honestly and positively. That's all we can ask anybody to do. And assume positive intent. Even if somebody says something and you, and you feel like you want to roll your eyes and say, how could you be so stupid? Assume that they, they really had best intentions when they, did, when they said what they said. Be open to new ideas and relax and enjoy. Um, one of the reasons that we have, have it here at McMinimins so that we can have food and drink. When I was thinking about how to put this together, the thing that I thought about was, wow, we need to have some place where people can drink and have food because it's hard to be contentious over food to get indigestion. So we want, hey, you guys laugh. Ooh, this is exciting. So, so we want you to relax. Uh, McMinimins is our sponsor, and uh, we want to make sure that they are seeing some results with their cash register, too. So just eat and drink yourself. Follow-up activities, uh, just for fun. Those, the follow-up activities, these are the things that we're trying to get people to do. One of the things that folks do a lot of times is they'll go to a lecture, and they'll feel so good about the lecture. And then they go home and do the same things they've always done. And what we want folks to do is something different. Don't go home to your community where you don't know people of color or you don't know white people. Go home and get to know, you know, get to know the people who are at your table. We have little cards, little colored cards at the table for those folks who say, well, I don't have a business card. So give people your number. Get together, have coffee. And it says, go out for, uh, just for fun, go out and make friends with a person in your own ethnic group. 
I moved to an area in Portland that I had taught in, and there were kids of color, lots of kids of color at my school, so I just assumed there would be lots of people in the neighborhood who were of color, and boy, was I wrong. And the folks who were there were not very friendly. Everybody was white, they weren't very friendly, and I thought, gosh, these people aren't very friendly at all. So, of course, in my usual manner, after I'd been there a year, I got a couple of the neighbors that were friendly to help me throw one of those uh, block parties. So we threw one of those, we passed out flyers, four blocks wide, 10 blocks long, and about 50 people came. And what amazed me is that some of those people had lived in that neighborhood for 28 years and didn't know each other. So what I'm inviting people to do is go make friends with someone in your own ethnic group. Let me ask a question. How many of you know the people on your block, three houses to your left, the three houses to your right, and three in front of you? Now, if you know nine houses, and when I say no, meaning you know them, you've been in their house, you got their phone number, how many people know that? Look around the room. Go make friends with somebody in your neighborhood, okay? <laughs> we got one person. Let's hear it for Susie. Let's hear it for Susie. Susie does. How long have you lived there, Susie? 30 years. 30 years. And I bet you some, there's some other people here who have lived in their home 30 years and don't know folks either. This is part of the thing. I remember when we were kids, you know, your parents never worried about you. We didn't have to come in until it was dark. Because we, wherever we were, we were with people we knew. So get to know your neighbors. Talk to the people who are around you. And when you do, don't discuss race. If, you, if it's a person of color, or if you're a person of color and it's a white person, don't talk about race. Just talk about what you have in common, you know? Things like, gee, that's a nice shirt you have on. Or you just never know what, where it's going to lead in a discussion. You never know what you'll find out from people when you talk to them. You might develop a relationship from it. So, um, and the question is, how many people of color, if you are white, and how many white people and people of other ethnicities are on your speed dial? Now, what I call speed dial is those are your people that you call up and say, hey, I just got a promotion, let's go have a drink. Hey. Me and the boyfriend broke up, need to talk. You know, those people you call at three o'clock in the morning. You say, who can I call and talk to? How many people from different ethnic groups are on your speed dial? And if they're not, the question is why not? There are a couple of premises that we have here at Race Talks, and there's a great book that I'd love for you to read. It's called Courageous Conversations in Race. It is a part of the foundation that I used in helping to put together Race Talks. And one of the things that they talk about in Courageous Conversations of Race is that we make the assumption, we do talk about race and white is a race, and we make the assumption that white people have privilege. And a lot of white people would say, I don't have privilege, I work my butt off. Well, yes, you do work your butt off. But what you don't know is that people of color work harder, and they have to. And, um, and to help you kind of understand that, Think of yourself as a fish. You wouldn't ask a fish, how's the water? Fish don't even know they're in water. Just like white people don't know that they have privilege. But I'm a fish too. But somebody threw me on the dock. And every so often I get to jump in the water when I get a degree or I get a promotion or something great happens. I get to jump in the water and I'm like, wow, is this what it feels like? This is great, I'm loving this. And then next thing I know, somebody snatches me out and throws me back up on the dock, and I'm up there gasping for air. So it's not that people, white people don't work hard, because they do. And one of the things that um, really happens is that I think of life as being like a 100 meter race, and poor white people start at zero at the starting line, all the way up to the Rothschilds who start at 97. Those are the people who sold arms during World War II to both sides, to the Axis and the Allies, so they were making theirs no matter who. So people have different levels of privilege that they get to exercise. People of color start back behind that starting line, back to African Americans who are back at minus 50, and you say, why, why African Americans back at minus 50? Well, 
we're back at minus 50 because we're the most maligned group here in the, in the United States. And if you stop and think about it, I mean, think about it. So anyway, and when we're back there, we're blindfolded, one leg tied behind us carrying a piano, and the gun goes off. And we wind up either slightly behind, even, or slightly ahead. And the question is, how do you manage to do that when you've started so far behind? And it's because you know you have to work harder. And I, sometime I'm gonna make a film of this because I did this with my kids in my classroom. And it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen that it came out just like what I'm sharing with you. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and uh, we will, we will have a wonderful discussion afterwards. Thank you all for coming, and we're really excited that you're here. I can tell this is a tough audience. Boy. All right, for those who just came in, I'm Donna Maxey. I'm the founder director of Race Talks. I'm excited that you are here tonight. And um, I'm really excited to see such a great mix of folks. And so before we start, I'm about to make everybody uncomfortable. Yes. If there is, how many people of color here tonight? Okay, so there's one, to, there's a couple of tables here. I don't see any people of color. Uh, folks back here at the very back here, you need to recruit a person of color to please come sit at your table. Because you cannot talk about race if you don't have a person of color. Just like you cannot talk about childbirth without a woman. <laughs> so, um, there are a few things on the table here for you tonight. Let me see, what is what Sam is supposed to do? Okay, general overview and procedures. There's a sign-in sheet on the table. Please sign your name, email, all of that, and put it, uh, sign in. And so one person, whoever is at the table, who's a responsible, wonderful person, you be responsible and make sure that all those people sign their names. Is there a facilitator at every table? Would facilitators raise your hands, please? One, two, three, four. Why are you not at a table? Why are you not at a table? <laughs> you were late. Oh! <laughs> so we don't have enough facilitators, but we'll get some. Uh, we're going to turn somebody into a facilitator at the table. Probably one of those wonderful, responsible people. Okay. So, uh, please make sure that everybody signs in on the sheet. Now, we, sign, we have uh, professional units for teachers. How many teachers are here? Wonderful. Make sure you sign the sheet. Portland Public wouldn't give me the, the slips today, but you get two hours. Uh, see a, what do you call it? PDUs? PDUs, CPUs, some of those U's. So, towards your credentials. So, please sign up. We're working on getting them for attorneys and other folks too. Um, so, uh, things at the table. There is an evaluation on the evaluation. Please make sure you fill it out. Need this information for funders. Uh, and the, the race does matter. There are a lot of people put human or whatever and don't want to put nothing. I know you something. So please fill that in because they want to know. You know, I could care less, but they want to know. Okay, and then on the back is how to conduct your own small group discussion. So um, if you don't have a facilitator, we can do that. Levert, aren't you sitting with, aren't you back there and not facilitating? Yeah, Miss Levert, back there at the curtain. Is that, is that you hiding back there at the curtain? Lavelle, excuse me, Lavelle, Lavelle, Levert. You know, I know you both. <laughs> so you have to facilitate. <laughs> that man does facilitation for a job. <laughs> I know that's his paycheck. They need they need you at this table right here. Okay, this is paper for notes. In case you want to take notes, it's in your little basket. And you know how people always say I would give you my number, but I don't have a card. See those little colored pieces of paper? You got a card. And this is important, you need to be eyeballing people at your table because later on we're going to have a drawing at the very end of the evening, so you need to be eyeballing somebody that you want them to be the person that you get together with. So, just be checking them out, kind of sly like. Okay. And, let's see, do I have a brochure? I don't have a brochure. 
Somebody please hand me a brochure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do have a brochure. It's on the floor. Okay. So if you look at the back page of the brochure, um, we're going to talk about our ground rules. And um, I think I'll make the, the ground rules last. But before I do that, there are brochures at all the tables, so you need to get one of those so you have it. Okay, so uh, next month is, this month is Black Girl in Suburbia. Melissa Lowry is the writer-director. Uh, February 22nd, we're having Race Talks 2. That's our community police forum. It's at Madison High School Cafeteria, 2735 Northeast 82nd. Come and voice your opinion and a suggestion to local police officers. Um, and then March 8th, is the next film is um, the documentary film uh, Lessons of Basketball and War, along with uh, a Q and A with director Ron Work and the star Kevin Bacon. So that's a film about some three different tribes of Somali girls who don't get along. Their families don't get along because they're from different tribes, but they get learn to get along because of basketball. Okay, and I have a shameless advertisement. This is Bride and Groom, Portland Bride and Groom magazine. See that beautiful bride there? All right, Mama, stand up. So this is the proud Mama. So uh, go out and purchase the book. Her baby's on page 96, is it? Page 96 or something like that. So, you know, Mamas have to advertise. We did a lot of work. And the other thing is that we have Kadeen Burnett. Kadeen, wave your arms. Kadeen came down from Eugene. He's a student at the University of Oregon. And lives, uh, he lives originally in Vancouver, BC, and he's doing an interview for, is it Flux? Yeah, Flux Magazine. Flux Magazine, which is in Eugene. And he's coming to do uh, talk about race and race discussions. And so um, he might want to come and talk to you. So talk. Who knows your name? Might be in a magazine. All right. So I think I did all the business. I got that, got that, got that. Okay. Um, okay. Race Talks Ground Rules. And this is real important. And I, you know, I've read them before, but people want, when I, when I did this, we had a, I was doing some consulting. And these people had a major breakthrough. I mean, we had some major breakthroughs once people understood the ground rules and people opened up and started talking. So, listen to each other with curiosity. Respect differences. Agree to disagree. You don't have to try and persuade somebody to agree with what you think. All they need to do is be polite and listen to what you think. Uh, speak from the self and from the heart. Talk about your own personal experience. Um, I am notorious for talking about I know somebody who. And I do know somebody who, but that's not my story. That's their story. Respect confidentiality. And I think we went over this in the film, but you get to talk about what you did and what you talked about here, but you don't get to tell somebody else's information. You know, oh, Sue Jones that lives on North Street said, that's not okay. Um, contribute honestly and positively. It's, this is really important work. I don't know if you know, but by 2040, there'll be more people of color than there are white people. This is important work. We are, the people who are here tonight, we're the vanguard. There are a whole lot of people who cannot say that they have been in a room or been in a discussion with somebody from a different ethnic group. Just think about it. Assume positive intent. Understand that you will stick your foot in your mouth and understand that there will be people who want to do things to you. So, as a facilitator, my job is to help you take your foot out of your mouth and to help other people keep their foot from being someplace else on you. So, it's okay. Be open to new ideas. Some folks will be saying stuff that you don't agree with. That's okay. I don't agree with Donald Trump, necessarily. I don't even like his hairdo. But, he has the right to say that. So be open to hear what, he, what people have to say. Um, a white friend of mine told me, I need to put this one in, you may, you may experience discomfort. And I, the last one was relax and enjoy. He said, white folks don't relax and enjoy when they talk about race. This is very upsetting. That, they're uncomfortable. I said, all right, then we'll put this in here. You may experience discomfort. And if you do, that's okay. That means you're getting closer to an answer. That you're getting close to 
what the issues are and being able to talk about it. So what we, I, I, I really believe here we are about the R word. You go, race. No, that's not the R word. It's not that R. The, the R that we're about is relationship. And that's what's important. That's why I started the community police forums, because I figure it's hard to shoot somebody that you know. And if you have a relationship with people, it's hard to do terrible things to them. Although I do know some people who do some terrible stuff, and they still know you. But, uh, but that's not the point. The point is, is that this is a wonderful opportunity to get together. And at the end of the evening, we're giving away a $30 gift certificate for $25 gift certificate, I think it is, for um, a couple to come to McMinimins and get to know each other. Not to talk about race, but just to talk, to get to know each other. Is Lisa here tonight? No. Is um, Kathy here tonight? One of you might win. <laughs> I think Lisa has a rig. She wins all the time, I swear. And it's even not even when I'm pulling. So anyway. Sit back, enjoy. This is a film about a black girl in suburbia. Uh, this is a shameless plug. I went to Pacific University. The um, director, Melissa Lowry, went to Pacific University. Are there any other Pacific grads here? Sharon. Oh, I didn't know you went to Pacific, girl. Okay, all right. So Pacific and Forest Grove, good school. Um, and so I want you to enjoy the film. And you notice I'm not introducing the director. That's because she double booked. So she is in downtown Portland right now, finishing up. And when she finishes, she's going to rush over here. And by the time the film finishes, then she'll be here for a QA. and a All right? See you in about an hour. Too white to be black and too black to be white. Let me give you a little insight from the inside. Okay, so our director is here and she has eaten. So <laughs> we don't have to move. We're gonna put the um, put the um, if I could talk, I'd be dangerous. We're gonna put the mic over near you. You just stay there. Hi, everybody. And uh, then after we do the Q&A, we'll go on to, to uh, group discussions. So, do, do we want to finish grooving on this? Or? <laughs> um, okay, uh, if you have a question, come up this way. Mike, I'm gonna give this mic over to the questions. So, if you have a question, come forward. Y'all don't have no questions? Yeah, we got questions. Great. All right, come on. Hey, I know this woman had questions. Go ahead. This is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What would you like for our takeaway to be from this? I, I don't want to give you one thing. Give me all of it. <laughs> is different and you all view this oh, I'm sorry I got sidetracked um, we're all different and so we all saw this film with a different lens so whatever sparked in you watching this film whatever it was if it was one of the girls um, 
talking about that she's, you know, gets viewed as being African American when she's African. Um, whatever it is that sparked in you, that's what I want you to kind of uh, just sit on and marinate in for a little bit. Uh, if some of you are uncomfortable, great, that's awesome. I'm always going for that because a lot of times we uh, forget that being uncomfortable is just a part of life and it's a feeling and it'll pass, but part of that means that there's some growth taking place. Um, so there's just a lot. Whatever it was that sparked, I want to hear it too so you can come up and tell me and we can talk about that. Um, but yeah, just take away whatever it was and then go talk about it. Because that's the whole point. It's there's a lot of pain, a lot of pain. Yeah, it's just talking and keeping the dialogue going. Hi, um, Hi. this is an incredible movie. My background is in private schools, places Hi. like Choate and Andover, Phillips Exeter, that kind of school. Yeah. Um, and I've seen Prep School Negro and American Promise, and this is right up there with it. This is really? Like, this, I mean, yeah, and I know Michelle, too. This is right up there with it. Um, my question is, I noticed, like, the last young woman who had the um, Irish sister and was raised by the grandparents didn't oh, know her. Oh, yes. Okay. Who um, used to be Miss, she was Miss Oregon 2013. Okay. And so as she was mentioning kind of like her process of not having her... I'm assuming black father and mm -hmm. coming up in the family she did. Mm -hmm. She started talking about being who she was so that she could represent something to help educate people to have a better understanding, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And my concern is always with kids of color when they move into a space of feeling they need to educate people. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, do you have any sort of a conversation with these girls when this kind of thing comes up? Or how do you talk about that? Because that's a lot to put on a kid's back. Yeah. Um, it's hard because I feel like you can't get away from it. So in a way, you kind of have to, um, that, that kid has to have an outlet. Uh, for me, I tell the kids to take a day off. Um, I work at Jesuit High School, so I, I work at a, a private school. Um, I'm the new diversity and inclusion director. And I'm actually the first black woman to ever work at that school in years. So the diversity director that you guys saw in the film, I, I have her position. But she's still at the school. She's still at the school. But I, I now have, uh, have that position. But I tell my kids there who feel that pressure of always needing to be the teacher and always uh, needing to um, explain themselves and I understand that obviously and it's exhausting so I always tell them to take a break that it's okay to just say I, you know I'm taking a day off so you're gonna have to go ask somebody else about that because honestly they're not gonna get away from that you know they're, it's hard and even as an adult it's hard not to always be the teacher you know especially being here in Oregon so hi hi I was wondering um, like the people who you interviewed from your generation mm -hmm. versus the younger kids that you interviewed, did you notice like like a sense of encouraging progress with their experiences versus your peers from the your peers that you interviewed, or was it just kind of like we relate totally to all of our experiences? I think that the latter, yeah. I think it was more of just things obviously have, have not changed, and that was my whole reason of interviewing the old and the young because I wanted to see with all the new stuff that, the access that our kids have to, to learning about new things and everything that maybe some of that, you know, awareness would come up and um, honestly it was like mirrored, everything. Every experience was mirrored from back when I went to school to um, these girls now. And so if, that part was kind of difficult because I was hoping that there would be some sort of change, but not much at all. So I think it was more of there was a relief factor because those the girl the Portland girls, which were the girls outside, none of them really knew each other. Um, but you could see that they the more they each started talking about their experience, and one would say, "Oh my God, that's me too," or "Oh my God, yeah, I went through the same thing," or "I had this friend that did the same thing." They got more comfortable with each other, and they were just happy that they weren't by themselves. So I think there was more of a sense of. Um, uh, connection and just knowing that they're not alone and they were validating each other's experiences because if you're by yourself you think you're the only one going through it you think you're crazy that it's not really happening 
you know, so I think in a way it helped them to sort of know that they're not by themselves in their experiences. Hello. Hi. My name is Mahiska. I am a U of O grad. What up? Over here. Ooh, you know. <laughs> um, so a lot of those women, I call them women now because they are women. They are, yeah. Yes, I, I know them. You do? I know them. So does my roommate, my best friend. We know them. We grew up with them. And it's funny because the community that, that you that they talk about, yeah. that's our community. Wait, you're talking, oh, in Eugene? In Eugene, that's our community. So you know community. all the Eugene All girls. those girls, oh, nice. all of them. And yeah. it's interesting because Eugene's small. Yeah. It's nothing like Portland. Mm -hmm. we, we hope to be like Portland, but I don't think that's gonna ever happen. <laughs> but that's it's just funny. interesting because I thought about it, and so did, so did my roommate. Like, our community is that small, mm -hmm. and I wonder about how a lot of people who did grow up in a community that, that was not really diverse, like myself, mm -hmm. you know, where can they go to for help? Who can they talk to as a mentor? Because me personally, I had a lot of mentors, but because I went to a black church, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have black churches to go to. Yeah. And that was, you know, growing up in different areas around the United States, like that's different. Yeah. But I'm, I'm only speaking for myself that those girls that I grew up with, I knew them. Either I knew their family because they owned, you know, places and you could go talk to them, yeah. or because they knew my family. But like, it was, it's, it's hard to build a network that, that's huge, mm -hmm. and that's why we keep a small community like the, the girls that you saw yeah. there. Yeah, it, it, it's hard, and again, like you said, depending on where you live, if you have, if you have black churches, um, I always think if those for those girls that have a strong family support system, I mean that's huge, especially living in a community like Eugene or in Oregon. Um, that's a huge factor. If you don't have that family network, um, it can be difficult. And then if you don't have support at school, if there is no uh, director of diversity or equity or inclusion, if there is, or if there are no teachers that look like you, if you don't really connect with the other black kids that are at your school. It can be <clears throat> very lonely, and I do know of um, of women that had that very lonely experience and and finding it very difficult. And part of that could be personality too, is you know um, more introverted. Um, but it, you know, for me, it's if they have a strong family background, then they're good. Like we, with my two girls, my husband and I, make sure that we. You know, we've got a very large family, so it's about, you know, when you come home, especially, you might be the only one in your classroom, or you might, I might be the only one at the grocery store, and dad might be the only one at work, even though he's not now, because he works at Jesuit too, <laughs> which is interesting. We're like the only black couple, so we gotta, you know, our conversation has to be short and quick. <laughs> in the hallway. Um, but it, I think that's what we all have to work on, right, is building up those kids that are feeling left out, and not just because they're tall or um, short or have acne, but because they're having this very real experience. So it's, it's a process, and it's going to take a lot of work. No, uh, I think it's not just going to take a lot of work, but I also think it's going to take a lot of years. Because just yeah. from looking from your generation to now my generation, mm -hmm. what's going to happen with the next generation? Right. What has what have we accomplished yeah. in the last 10, 20 years? Years. And part of that is just conversating with your kids. Like a lot of people are scared to have a conversation about race with their children, and it's not that scary. You can have a five-minute conversation with your five-year-old, and it could just be quick to the point because, you know, with five-year-olds it goes through one ear and out the other. But <laughs> just so you are planting seeds, you know, so they're prepared. Um, I know. Well, I'll tell that story there. Okay, you go. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Matana. Um, and this is a little bit off topic, but still related to what you created. Um, I'm a film major, and I, I'm here because I'm an assistant editor at my school newspaper at my college. Um, so I just kind of popped in. But uh, I'm kind of wondering, as far as the cinematic aspect of your film, um, you know, first of all, like, who was the director of uh, cinematography? And second of all, like, Kind of going into it before it before you started filming, what was kind of your image for the techniques and like the tone using um, using the camera? Oh my oh, gosh! 
why don't we stick to the questions about race? And you can talk to her. <laughs> okay, so you can be marinating on those okay. questions. All right. So we're going to run over. Is it okay if we uh, let these three people ask their question? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Kadeem Burnett. I'm a senior at the University of Oregon. And I just want to echo the points of, of the last speaker who went to the University of Oregon. Everything she said about small community and not very diverse mm -hmm. is absolutely true. So, um, and personally, I'm very interested in education. My father's a teacher, my mother's a librarian. And um, I'm writing a story about dialogue in, like, about race, racial dialogue in the classroom. And I'm, my question to you is, because I was, was hearing the women and the young women in the, in the movie talk about their experiences in the classroom not wanting, wanting to be labeled as sensitive or wanting to be have the burden of representation for an entire race of people. And I just wanted to know, do you think that it's then possible, the idea of an equitable classroom where one group can say what they want to say mm -hmm. and not be attacked and ridiculed, whereas another group can also speak freely and not be labeled or blanket state or have a blanket statement made about them? Do you understand? I'm trying to process. I guess, okay. I guess my, I, 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 let me just try to be more specific, but just to be, to be candid, a lot of times in our class discussions, the white students, their idea of a safe space is being able to say whatever they want with complete candidness and have that be accepted and no repercussions, whereas the black students, or sorry, students of color, can, their idea of a safe space would be being able to speak freely about their experiences and right. not have that labeled as a, that is the blanket statement for their entire base. Right, yeah. Um, Oh, that's so hard. This is, yeah, and that's part of where we need more support in administration and with more professors and teachers. And in, in my experience, and again, I'm going to speak from being in this institution right now for the last four months and just observing white students and black students. And uh, I have, so in my office, I have a nice sized office, and a lot of times, all of the, well not all of them, but uh, many brown and black students are in my office hanging out. My door is always open, and what I have observed is white students walking by and just peeking in, and then they keep walking. And then they walk in, peek in, you know, and they just walk by the office. And then one day, I saw one of my students, I have snacks and stuff in there, which is probably why they're in there all the time, <laughs> um, standing by the door throwing red vines into the hallway. I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, my friend wanted some red vines. Okay, oh, well, tell your friend to come in here and get some red vines. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He is not coming in here. Oh, really? Why is he not coming in here? Oh, you know. No. What? He's white. And I was like, so? And he was like, oh, no. He, you know, all the white kids, they don't come in here because they don't want to be the only white kid. I was like, ah, what? So, and this happened on many, 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 many occasions. So finally I told the kids, okay, another rule, you know, on top of all the other rules, no more throwing food out into the hallway. You have to have to be a rule. Um, and I mean, literally, these kids would not, I mean, their friends, their, their brown or black friend would walk in the office, they would literally stand in the doorway. And it was like, did you, do you think if you walk in, then your whole color is just gonna, your pigmentation is gonna get darker? Like, you know, what is the problem? And one kid one day came in, or again, wanted a red vine. I said, come on in. And he just stood at the door and he goes, oh, I'm not part of this club. There was nobody in the office but me. I'm not part of this club. I was like, oh, I don't see anybody in here. There's no club. You can, it's okay. You can come get a red vine. They're from way over here by me. You gotta go get one. And so he was like, ah, oh, no. And I just really thought this kid was thinking that he was gonna like explode or I don't know. So he ran in real quick, grabbed some red vines, and ran back to the doorway. And I was like, you feel better? <laughs> he was like, oh, okay, thanks, Ms. Larry. But just, and talking, and then I had a, a teacher bring in a whole group of students, and they were all visibly very uncomfortable, which was great, because, you know, I like uncomfortableness. And I said to them, so, and, you know, I said, do you guys, I know this is your guys' first time in, in the diversity office, and, um, What's one of the reasons why you think a lot of you guys don't come in here? And one girl said, because I'm white and I don't want to be the only one in here. And I said, okay, well think about that. Now, what do you think your friends that are in here, what do you think they feel like when they're in the hallway or when they're in the classroom? 
And she was like, oh, probably like how I feel. And I said, yeah. And I said, but the difference is you have a choice to come in here. They don't have a choice to be in the hallway or in the classroom. And she was like, yeah, I could see that. And I was like, yeah, but I, just in talking, these kids need conversation. Like they are wanting to talk about it, but there's no, they don't have the tools to, you know, have those conversations. And being in it, in, in my office, the brown and black kids, it's their safe space. So they talk freely, they can do whatever. And every once in a while, they'll say something in a classroom. And then the um, teacher may say something like, you know, not so, not so uh, blunt as you're too sensitive or anything like that, but something that's in regards to like, okay, now it's time for you to kind of shh, be quiet a little bit. And then the white students don't know how to react to that. So I think it's just, again, training, Teachers need training, we need more conversation, and not to be afraid to have those conversations. And I just, I think it's just to bring that stuff up when it happens, you know? If, you know, the teacher should be on top of that, and if the student should be on top of that, and say, wait a minute, there's a whole disconnect here in how we're able to talk about stuff. So, that was a really long way to answer so. Okay, hi, thank you hi. for making this documentary, first of all. Um, and then I want to just, I don't know if there are any boomers in the audience, but I don't know how black boomer women made it out of their generation without extensive therapy. <laughs> but, because uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> it was hard. Um, I, my experience mirrored yours. I um, grew up in uh, Chino Hills, one of three black families in a brand new planned community, and it was absolutely rough. Um, and that was where I realized that I was black. That was where I realized I was different. That was where I realized that your mom said you couldn't date somebody my skin color. You know, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And that was like in 88, 90. Um, and at 37 years old, I'm just now confronting my own issues with race, my own issues with interracial dating, because some of those, um, you know, when you grow up, when you grow up being told by society that everything about you is ugly because you're black, mm -hmm. it it damages you. Yeah. And I didn't realize the kind of damage that it does to you. I mean, girls struggle with self-esteem anyway, mm -hmm. just because of the world we live in. Right. But when you put the color thing on top of it, something you can't change no matter how much you exercise, whatever. Right. Um, you know, it just, it really, really affects you. So I'm in the process of shedding my own issues with race and my own racial baggage. And I was just curious as to where you are in your journey in terms of letting go some of that. You know, I was in elementary school too, the first time I was called a nigger. And thankfully, my we celebrated Kwanzaa. So we were always the lab rats. My brothers and I had African names. Right. Always the lab rats in school. Um, so, you know, I didn't mind being the teacher. But, um, you know, where are you in your journey with yeah. shedding that? It's hard, because like you said, if you've been, your brain has been conditioned for so long, and we all have this sort of conditioning going on where we're all, when you come out of the womb, you're automatically put in a box, just based off of your color, right? Um, and then if you decide you don't want to be in that box, then you get questioned, and then it's a sort of, so I feel like we all, in a way, have been conditioned to um, have you know, these thoughts about each other and these assumptions about each other, even if we want to or don't want to, they're just there automatically because of what um, our society has sort of created. Um, for me, I'm, I still struggle with wanting to make people comfortable. Um, so when, even as an adult now, when I hear comments or I, um, I mean, just happened last week. Just this woman just was so rude to me and so cold to me. And it was that that feeling that you get when somebody looks at you a certain way. You guys know, you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, thank you. Because somebody said that and they were like, well, maybe they're just having a bad day. I'm like, no, it's not just me. And other people were nodding. I, just, I said, I don't know any of these people. And they're nodding because they understand. I said, that, we all can't be lying. Like, <laughs> So I, I am still struggling with having, with, with um, expressing my voice, with sharing my voice and my truth when something happens. When, it, when something like that happens, 
I struggle with saying, um, excuse me, miss, is there a problem? <laughs> because I see you chatty, chatty, hi, hi to everybody else, and then you come to me and it's just straight cold. Is there a problem? Because I don't believe we've met before, you know. But I struggle with that because I don't want to be the crazy black woman, right? I don't want to be the, ah. um, So that's kind of where I'm at in my journey, and I tell my girls, my black girls at the school to, you know, that it's okay. It, now is the time to share your voice because a lot of times people really want to know. They might be a little upset and they might be a little uncomfortable, but they'll get over it. But they actually really want to know how you feel or if they've offended you. Now, some people don't really care, but, you know, at least you've said your piece. So I think that's the part that I've struggled with and continue to sort of break down my own conditioning of needing to make other people, you know, sort of comfortable. I talk about being on, um, I, I call it my smiley face elevator thing that I used to do, which is, you know, if I was getting on an elevator and it was full of all white people, I would smile to everybody and nod, hello, hi, how are you, hello, hi. And then one day I was doing it, and it was just one of those things that just, it was an automatic sort of thing that I did. And then I, I got on one day, I did my hello, hi, how are you today? This man in the back just, oh, he gave me that look. So I was like, ugh, <laughs> whatever. Um, and then I was thinking to myself, I was so mad. I was like, why is he looking at me like that? And then I was like, because he don't care if he's smiling or not. <laughs> and then I had a light bulb moment. I was like, Melissa, why are you trying to make these people comfortable? You don't know them. They don't know you. If anything, you should be scared. And they should be smiling at you. <laughs> so, I mean, so that I had to re rewire my brain to, to be conscious of when I'm doing something like that, you know. And so I, I'm trying very hard now to, when something happens, to just take a breath think about it, get the courage up to actually say my truth, and then move on. So that's kind of where I'm at right now with that. And yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael, and uh, I work in education, and I, the, like everybody else said, the movie is really incredible, and I wish that when I was a kid I had gotten to see that, because I can definitely like think about the, the you know, one or two black girls who are in my classes a lot growing up. Um, and I really would have like benefited from hearing that perspective because that's not something that's easy to share. And uh, so what I wanted to ask you was um, for for like those teachers that uh, a couple of the educators were talking about, who were like you know race comes up, like you know you're reading the book or mm -hmm. you're talking about that period in history or whatever it is, and there's the one or two black kids in the room. What like especially if you're like a, a white teacher or if you're somebody else in that position, what can you do or what should you do? And I realize this is probably not a thing where you give like a two minute answer and it's done. Yeah. But you know maybe <laughs> just like some starters for for anybody who might be in that situation. Yeah. Well, first I say if you're not comfortable talking about race, then just call in sick that day and get a sub. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing I would say is go talk to your coworkers. Like, when's the last time you talked to your coworkers about race? Like, go ask them if they've got any pointers, if you're uncomfortable talking about the N-word and Huck Finn or whatever whatever book it is that you're reading that you're a little like, ooh, I don't know. Um, communicate with your students. Get to know your students. Um, and then if you have an issue and you feel like after class you, you may have, you feel like you may have um, offended the student, you know, take them to the side and say, if, I, if I've if i said anything or if I've done anything in talking about this subject, you know, please, you, you need to communicate with me. I can take it, let me know. Um, really simple things. Um, I've, I've heard of just crazy things that teachers have done with students. A mom had come up and said that one teacher was waiting outside her classroom for her daughter and the daughter came up and the teacher was like, oh, uh, you get a free period because we're talking about slaves. And of course, the daughter is going to be like, cool, bye. <laughs> and, uh, so, but just the fact that that teacher was not comfortable talking about slaves with this one black student in her class and then decided to give her a free period, right? Like, she has to learn like everybody else. So treat the students like students first. And then if you're uncomfortable, again, call in sick. Or go talk to your coworkers. You know, there's resources. Go use your resources and don't be afraid to ask, you know, um, those questions, but I get that a lot. Like, can you write out like a guideline of suggestions? And I'm like, no, go figure it out. Like, 
because you'll have those people that will that's all though they will depend on that thing and they won't they won't go any way you know they won't have any flexibility with it they'll just say nope this is what we have to do but every kid is different every teacher is different so it's like parenting there's no one book that fits everybody you know all right thank you a 50-minute discussion, and McMinimins is going to let us stay. So if you have to leave at 9 o'clock, you can leave, but we're going to stay and do our discussion, and then um, and then after we do our 50-minute discussion, we're going to do a, you know, a 10-minute wrap-up and do the drawing. So if you have to go, go. Um, for educators, I I'd love for you to stay. Um, I'd like to do a couple of things that are different here tonight, since there are so many people here. Um, if we could break the groups in half, and half the group kind of gather around each other and talk, and the other half gather around and talk, um, that means one half is going to have, how many, where are the professional facilitators? Please raise your hand. Okay, so why are you over there doing this? professional. I'll put your hand up in the air. Good Lord. She's a professional. All right. Okay. All right. So there are not that many facilitators. So most of you are going to be in a discussion without a facilitator. So um, what I would really love is for, for the groups to kind of break in half and just talk. And those people who've been standing up the whole time, there are some empty chairs because a few people left. So you might want to come get a chair so you can sit down during the discussion. And, um, and as far as teachers are concerned, um, Michael, I would be happy to talk with you or any other teachers and, and share some things up here that are some suggestions, but be prepared because you might not have a job. So, um, but anyway, we're going to break into our groups. We have our evaluation on the back is how to conduct a small group discussion without a so you don't have a facilitator. And just go through, basically it says, introduce yourselves, do like 30 second intro. Wait, wait a minute y'all, wait, 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 wait. I'm a third grade teacher now. That means warm cookies, cold milk, everybody's gonna play nice. And you're listening to the teacher for 30 seconds here. Okay, so go through, look at this, and the questions are here. The questions are a guide to open discussion. You do not have to do the questions. You don't have to do all of them. You don't have to do them in order. You don't have to do anything. The point is just to talk. So break into uh, smaller groups and start your discussion. And if you want to talk about classroom stuff, I'll be up front. All right, go for it. I'll call you back in about 40 minutes, all right? Go Can for I it. also say, too, if you have to leave, grab a poster and a business card and then do all that Facebook, Twitter, Twitter stuff. Where's your, where's your posters? They're on the back table. The posters are on the back table. So she brought enough, did you bring enough for everybody? I hope so. Okay, so grab one poster and go. Um, and let me see here. So next, next uh, Race Talks program, uh, Community Police Forum, which is at, um, which is at, I put the wrong thing on here which is at Madison High School, February 22nd on 82nd, and I think it is Thompson or something like that. And then next month, uh, McMinimins will be, um, wow, I must have been asleep when I put this one together. Okay, and next time will be bas uh, Lessons of Basketball and War. So, hope to see you next time. Now, it's all great. We really enjoy that you were here. Thank you, thank you, and we'll see you next month.